Um, so I might um, just endorse the other acknowledgements that, um, uh, that we've heard from uh, Dr Matt Collins and from Ahmed Keskin as well. Um, but I will acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, it's important that we all acknowledge that this was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, what I will do, do is, though, in terms of acknowledgements, is um, perhaps just acknowledge our two main partnering organisations here. Um, bit of a pop quiz. There is 30 days in Ramadan, Ahmed. You said you're hosting 40, 41 iftar dinners. How are you doing that? So you've got one family member there, one family member here. Okay, so there's 30 days in Ramadan. This guy's doing 41 dinners. Don't know how you're doing it. Uh, Ahmed's an absolute um, veteran um, in the Muslim community, and I think it's really important that we acknowledge the work that he does. Ramadan is a time of family and, and coming together of families, and Ahmed dedicates this month essentially um, to giving back to the community um, and to, to showcase and share Islam with um, people that might not have attended an iftar dinner before or not know much about the faith. So I think it's important we acknowledge the, the work you've done. <laughs> that then brings us to our second organisation, uh, the Victorian Bar. Um, I can tell you um, I started in the profession about 10 years ago um, and there's no denying that I was quite anxious walking in to Owen Dixon Chambers for the very first time. Um, and um, Matt, you referred to uh, the paintings that were up on the wall and um, as prestigious as it is, um, I secretly on the inside um, thought to myself, I can't wait one day until I see someone that looks like me or someone that I know up on the, on the walls there. So um, I really look forward to that day, whether it's her Honour um, Jacinta Forbes or um, my good friend uh, Magistrate Masood, um, that, that's, a, that's a very exciting prospect. And I know um, that something like that is very possible to happen um, thanks to your leadership. Um, it's not easy challenging the status quo um, and it's not easy bringing in uh, change, uh, especially when you're a minority. Um, and you've done that, uh, and you've done that in terms of bouncing the ball and starting a really important conversation about diversity at the bar. Um, so know that you have all our support behind you uh, and know that um, from, you know, the biggest of judges to QCs to the small little lawyers like myself, uh, it has a huge impact and it, and it makes everyday people's lives just so much better. So thank you for your leadership. <clears throat> so with that, um, my good friend Ahmed, who's organising 41 dinners in 30 days, um, actually approached me just a couple of days ago and said, yeah, you're sweet to talk for 20 minutes at this iftar dinner. And I called him up and said, uh, are you sure you got the right person? Anyways, so what I'll speak to you tonight about is a bit about Ramadan and, and my experiences of Ramadan um, and then tell you a bit about my career and, and my journey into the law and some of my observations and, um, and futures for the profession. Um, so Ramadan, it's the holiest month in the Islamic calendar um, and no doubt it's quite an exciting time for the Muslim community. Uh, so I'm here tonight, my brother's off at another iftar dinner and my mum is having iftar with my sister at home and every day there's a bit of a coordination who's going where and, and who's doing what. Um, but as Ramadan gets underway, it forces you to forget about food um, and to really take a deep dive reflection into oneself. Um, as we were discussing at the table, um, it no doubt is an annual detox that really puts you in good stead for the year ahead. From the moment you commence your fast, you're really conscientious about your actions and about your connection with God. And most importantly, you're really conscientious of your interactions with others. And that's only one part of Ramadan, because Ramadan is also about mercy, it's about forgiveness, um, and most of all, it's about charity. Um, the fast makes you reflect upon and show compassion for those that are less fortunate and maybe don't have the food that we have here today. At the end of the 30 days, Ramadan is met with Eid, and Eid is the Muslim celebration. It's a bit like Christmas, um, and uh, it signals the end of the 30-day fast, and it's one big heck of a celebration. 
<clears throat> For me personally, though, um, Ramadan is really m met with mixed emotions because uh, you get into a habit of just catching up with friends. Um, some people in this room I'll see a couple of times throughout the month of Ramadan. Um, and as a community, you're really at the peak of your spiritual um, being. Um, and knowing that we're all in this together for 30 days, at the end of the month, it's, it's all a bit sad because it's coming to an end. Um, so for those at your first iftar dinner, I hope you enjoy the warm hospitality um, and the generosity um, and that brotherhood and sisterhood that you'll always feel um, at a Ramadan iftar dinner. It's pretty unique to the month of Ramadan and, and I really hope you all experience that because we're pretty horrible the rest of the year. <laughs> um, so with that, let me tell you a bit about me. No, I'm just joking. We're, we're pretty good. Um, it does exist after Ramadan, I can tell you that. <laughs> Um, but let me tell you a bit about me and, and a bit about my journey into the law and, and a couple of you have already heard my story um, but um, I love my mum and, and a, lot of it, a lot of who I am centres around my mum so I like, I like sharing my mum's story. Uh, so bear with me those that have heard this before. Um, so both my parents, they were born in Sri Lanka um, and in the late 1970s my dad who had already migrated to Australia um, like a good Sri Lankan boy, went back to Sri Lanka and, and married my mum. Um, and together they came back to Australia um, and had three children here. Um, my mum knew absolutely no one and nothing about the way of life in Australia. Um, and she got a job at Telstra and was doing word processing. Um, and I remember my dad would always pick my mum up from the same corner in, in the city um, on the corner of Collins Street. And every day my mum would be waiting there at the same time, every day. But my mum would always be swaying left to right. She'd never be standing still. And my dad was always wondering why my mum was always swaying left to right. And then one day she was driving home and she fi my dad finally asked my mum, why are you always swaying left to right whenever I pick you up? And my mum explained that where she stood was a sign. The sign said, no standing any time. <laughs> My mum and dad bought a business that was really successful, um, but over time things went downhill. Uh, and not long after my first birthday, uh, my dad actually relocated back to Sri Lanka. Um, and in the process, he left my mum with a number of legal issues to resolve. Um, my mum knew absolutely no one in Australia and, and nothing about the legal system and how it works here. Um, eventually though, she tracked down an old family friend who was a retired Sri Lankan lawyer. Um, and prior to his retirement, he used to specialise in what he called ADT. Anyone specialise in ADT? Any damn thing? Um, uh, he referred my mum to some lawyers and I remember when I was about three or four, I attended these lawyers with my mum. Um, and I would witness how these lawyers would allay my mother's fears um, and how my mum felt reassured that the matters of her family were being dealt with by people she could trust. So I remember going in with her and she'd be really anxious and nervous and when we'd walk out she'd be really calm. I wasn't quite sure what these people did, um, but from witnessing this I made a personal commitment to myself to, to be whatever they were. Um, and over time I, I determined and found out that they were in fact lawyers. It's a bit nerdy, but to date I've actually never considered any other career path. Growing up I used to tell my mum, don't worry mum, just wait, I'll become a lawyer and I'll, I'll help you out. Um, so the day I was admitted as a lawyer, um, you can imagine how proud she was um, and my mum was in tears um, because she knew I became a lawyer for her. Actually, in fact, I've got an older brother, he's one year older than me and he'd by that stage taken a break because he'd decided to become a comedian. So on the one hand she's like crying that I'm becoming a lawyer, on the other hand she's like yelling at my brother, look at your younger sister, she's becoming a lawyer. Uh, so it was a mixed emotions day. Um, <clears throat> but my mum's experiences really opened my eyes to the journey an individual can take to merely just have access to the law. Um, so for me now, um, I'm really committed to using my legal skills to ensure that the voiceless and the vulnerable have a platform to be heard and to contribute to society. And when I was thinking about my address tonight, in the whole three, four days that Ahmed gave me, um, I was reflecting on the past 12 months um, and events which have occurred around the world um, which have really tested our unity and our social attitudes and at times have really disrupted our sense of equality. From Christchurch to Hakim al Arabi's detention in Thailand um, to the po political discourse within our own country. 
we're so connected um, and how we respond to events and injustices as Ahmed mentioned just through your phone or at a computer have the ability to create significant broad social change and if you take the safe Hakim case as an example it was a powerful moment to see a young refugee celebrated in the centre of our democracy. But what was extraordinary, though, was the way in which sport used its position of influence. And in the pursuit of social justice, sport started a very important conversation about the potential role sport plays in, so in shaping social attitudes. And it made me reflect on my own profession and our profession as lawyers. We all have a vital role to play in the promotion and the protection of human rights to ensure that all Australians have a fair go. And better than anyone, we understand how the law underpins our successful, diverse and democratic nation. And in our everyday work, how important it is to preserve the rule of law to advance social justice. And with that, I was reflecting on our own current political and social landscape and I asked myself, amongst the atrocities and the injustices that are faced internationally and domestically, are we ourselves giving justice to our fight for justice? Critical to this is the need for us as a profession to collectively stand at the forefront of advancing social justice. I mean, may we never become complacent where the fight for equality and the fight for human rights becomes reserved for a select few. However, for us to respond and be at the forefront of addressing varied injustice, we need to reflect the views of ordinary Australians, which means we provide a voice for all to be heard. And in thinking about this, it made me reflect upon our own profession and it made me ask myself, do we as a profession reflect the makeup of Australia? Do our workplaces and our chambers look and feel like the makeup of our nation? And what about our bench and the judiciary? Do, do they reflect the views and attitudes of ordinary Australians? And what about our jurors? I know we're more diverse than the political leadership of our country, but assessing where we stand as a profession makes you reflect on whether we're equipped to provide access to justice for all. Generally speaking, we gravitate towards an injustice we face ourselves. When things happen around the world, we all hear the saying, it was so close to home. Where individuals can relate, it's felt. So without a diverse range of, of voices, opinions and values at the table, not only are we likely stuck in a groupthink scenario, we arguably become limited in our definition of justice. And when I started working in the law, it was clear the profession significantly lacked diverse voices. Um, and over the last nine to ten years that I've been in the profession, no doubt a lot has changed. I remember the first day I was in court, I was instructing um, as an article clerk um, and I was standing at court in the county court um, with two barristers um, uh, who I was quite intimidated by at the time but have now become great friends and mentors of mine, James Mile QC and Maria Pilpasides. I remember I was standing at court with them um, and I was mistaken for an interpreter. I won't forget that moment because it really struck me and I was already out of my comfort zone and then to, to have someone come up to me and go, oh, thank God the interpreter is here. Um, but I won't ever forget the moment and it's really, um, it's ingrained in my brain, but the moment that James Mile QC, and if anyone knows James, you'll know what his personality is like, um, he proudly corrected uh, that person and said, uh, no, she is my instructing solicitor. Um, and he said it in such a proud voice. Um, and from that moment I knew um, my image of being different um, was something that I had to tackle, but I knew that I had others with me to join me on that pursuit and I could share the burden of normalising different um, with terrific advocates at the bar such as James and Maria and, and Miguel who's here and, and Jacinta's been a great supporter too. Um, just last week, the Financial Review published findings from a recent report on advancements at the bar, and, and it's no credit to, um, to Matt's leadership and the, and the team. I won't go through the stats that we've um, mentioned. Um, it's worth celebrating these stats, but there's no denying that there still is a long way to go. In recent times, we've seen the way in which political leaders have inflamed and used diverse, divisive sentiment to strengthen their political agenda. 
I mean, you, you don't need to look much further than the recent federal election campaign and some of the minority voices and, and the um, campaigns that they ran. We've all felt that moment of disbelief and shock when things are said and published. And in each of these instances, whilst they've provided my brother, who's a comedian, with some material, um, it hasn't provided much more than that. Um, but for me, what has mattered most in those moments is what and how others have responded. And in those moments, which have really shocked us, um, what has mattered most to me and what has concerned me most is the fear of silence. Turning a blind eye to negative rhetoric and potentially becoming immune to divisive negative reporting puts us in dangerous territory. And we can't allow this to become the norm. In fact, people on the receiving end are more troubled by an injustice when bystanders do nothing. There's a, there's a Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights report that concludes, research shows that when we fail to respond to low level racist incidents, it creates an environment where this type of behavior is tolerated, replicated and can escalate. Indeed, it is the failure to bear witness to racism and hatred that is often harshly felt by victims who feel isolated and fear when subject to racism in their daily lives. When people affected by racism are supported by bystanders, they report productive effects on their sense of belonging, citizenship and community. So as individuals and as barristers and as members of the bar, we have an important role to play in advocating for equality. For example, at my workplace at Morris Blackburn, we don't speak on panels unless the panel is reflective of diversity. And whilst I speak of that, I think it's important that we rethink the often flared, flawed understanding that some hold about the concept of merit. That will then assist us in embracing targets and quotas to level the playing field as we also celebrate milestone achievements. For example, we celebrate the success of boards which, which have gender balance of men and women. Or for example, when I was appointed as a principal at Morris Blackburn, my colleagues weren't reported in the financial review, but I was, and it was reported with first Muslim woman partner. These taglines have the easy ability to reduce one's merit to tokenism. And on reflection, it really does seem ridiculous that we celebrate these things as it should just be business as usual and the norm where women are appointed to positions of leadership. But there is a fine balance between recognising achievements which have challenged the status quo and acknowledging that. So for me personally, I personally dislike speaking about multiculturalism and about women in the law and about diversity. But until it is at a stage where it's business as usual, we need to continue to advocate and to build the conversation. In the alternative, the negative rhetoric will just continue. I remember this one time I featured on my firm's social media about a case that I'd run um, for a very special client um, and never had a lawyer and their pursuit for social justice brought about more discussion about citizenship and visa laws and border protection, my name and Peter Dutton was used in the same sentence. In fact, it was one of Morris Blackburn's most engaged with social media stories and not for the right reasons. Um, you can go have a look at it. It's still there featured on Morris Blackburn's um, social media together with a sermon from the then chairman about respect. So to conclude, the legal profession has a special, indeed privileged role in advocating for equality and there's no denying that we have come a very long way. As legal practitioners, our legal skills create opportunities for influence and just like in the case of Hakeem, it is fundamentally the community that promotes and protects our national commitment to fairness. There's no denying that all Australians deserve the same protection under the law and we're entitled to be treated equally no matter who we are and what makes up our Australian identity. And as lawyers and as barristers, we have an important position of influence and we must constantly challenge ourselves to exercise constant vigilance to ensure the path to freedom and equality continues for all Australians. Thank you.